Hello everyone, I am The Enforcer, and welcome to the breaking news. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and support us on Patreon, link in the description below. Today we have absolutely breaking news. From a massive fire breaking out in Moscow to the highest turret toss ever seen so far in the war, we've also heard that Iranian military officials are stating that the country's armed forces are prepped and ready for the largest retaliatory strike against the state of Israel ever seen, and not only that, we are also beginning to hear that apparently the President of the United States is rushing back from Camp David and returning to the White House immediately. We have been hearing absolutely breaking news today and a massive amount of information is coming out showing us that things are getting very heated inside the Middle East and not only that, once again inside of Ukraine. Starting off with our first piece of news today, we have been able to hear that Iranian military officials stated this Saturday that all of the country's armed forces have been placed on the highest alert and are anticipating Israeli strikes. From what we understand, the Israeli armed forces are still preparing for some sort of retaliatory strike against the Islamic Republic of Iran. These strikes are going to be some of the largest ones that we've seen so far. As we have heard Israeli officials just yesterday stating that a massive strike against the Islamic Republic is being prepared. From what we understand, the Iranian armed forces are not going to let this attack go unprovoked. And they are going to be responding in full scale like they always have once the strike occurs. A major development and once again showing that this is no longer a small tit-for-tat sort of a missile exchange. This is a full-scale regional war that is going on at this moment, and both sides are adamant that a strike will be responded with with an immediate counter-strike. We've also been able to hear that according to information that we've gotten from Iran's civil aviation organizations, that all flights to Iran's airports have been canceled due to operational restrictions. This is once again showing that a warlike nature has come about inside the Middle East, especially with the Islamic Republic of Iran, as this is the exact same kind of action that occurred with the state of Ukraine when the invasion of Ukraine began in 2020 by the Russian Federation. This sort of an action is showing that they are preparing for a massive amount of ordnance from the Israelis and from themselves to be exchanged over the next several days, and that they are preparing for this by making sure to shut down all civil uh, aviation in the area to make sure that this airspace is opened up for any kind of strikes that are needed, either the incoming strikes and air defense that would be necessary to try and stop those, and the return strikes that would be trying to hit and knock out Israel once again, a lot like the ballistic missile attack of several days ago. We've also been able to hear more major news that the President of the United States is departing Camp David at this very moment and returning to the White House at this instant. An incredibly major ordeal considering that we are understanding that the Middle Eastern situation is still once again at a complete fever pitch. It seems as though that the President of the United States is once again returning back to the White House preparing for the major situation that may be coming. From what we know, the United States is getting somewhat heavily involved in the Israeli counter response as the U.S. CENTCOM commander actually arrived in Israel about a day or two ago and is helping the Israeli Defense Forces prepare and plan for their counter-strike that will be conducted against the Islamic Republic of Iran. This is showing a much higher U.S. involvement than we originally anticipated, and it's also giving us an idea that the United States will most likely be a lot heavier involved in the defense of Israel if this situation was to arise where an even larger and more serious counterattack by the Iranians was to occur. We've also been able to hear that if Israel takes action, there is no doubt that an Iranian counterattack will be carried out. Once again, adding on to the news that we were hearing just a moment ago, the Iranian armed forces are 100% adamant that a counterattack will be conducted if there is any attack that occurs against Iran by Israel here in the near future. We also believe that this will extend to U.S. forces within the region as well, most likely at the Camp Victory Air Base, the Al-Assad Air Base, uh, and many others that the United States is stationed at throughout the region. We are also assuming that this may expand even over into other countries such as Saudi Arabia with the Yemeni Houthis possibly conducting attacks along Saudi Arabia's western coastline. Although that's a little bit unknown at the moment, but we do know that the Yemeni Houthis will be conducting long-range missile attacks against the state of Israel in their southern region near to the area of the port of Elit and all the way up to the area around Ashdod along Israel's western coastline. We've also been able to hear that the whereabouts, interestingly enough, of Ismail Khani, the, uh, the commander of the Kud force in the IRGC is still unknown. Nobody knows what's happened to this guy, and we've all been trying to figure this out, but it may be possible that Ismail Khani has been killed in an Israeli airstrike about a day ago. We're not really sure yet. People are still trying to figure out where he is or what he's doing, but so far, the whereabouts of this commander are completely unknown, and the 
existence of him is also unknown as well. He's really turned into the Schrodinger's IRGC officer, so we will be waiting to see if we can get any additional information on this guy, but for now we are assuming that he's either missing or dead until proven otherwise. Meanwhile, we were also able to get a very interesting piece of information as the Kingdom of Jordan has now officially declared neutrality, at least in the Iran-Israel exchange. Jordan has warned that Iran and Israel will not be able to violate their country's airspace or they will be fired upon. This is a very interesting statement and it actually is showing that apparently Jordan is relenting to international pressure from the Islamic Republic of Iran to not get involved and to not become a potential target themselves of future Iranian attacks. And while at the same time doing this, they're also denying Israel any involvement in their airspace either. This means that as far as the situation is concerned, Jordan just declared neutrality and are going to be uh, forcefully instilling this neutrality on both sides. Neither will the Iranians be able to fire missiles through Jordanian airspace, and the Israelis will not be able to fly their aircraft through Jordanian airspace to go and conduct an airstrike on the Islamic Republic of Iran. This is going to be a little bit interesting, and this is honestly setting up the Kingdom of Jordan to be able to try and mediate or broker a peace here in the near future in between the two sides, as they are now setting themselves up as a neutral party within the region, meaning that if anyone was actually going to try and resolve the conflict in between Israel and Iran, if there was ever a resolution, it most likely will be coming from the Kingdom of Jordan. So it seems as though not only is Jordan declaring neutrality, but they're also setting themselves up in the future to try and broker the peace that may or may not come out of this conflict. Moving on from that, we were also able to hear that while Jordanian airspace has been closed down, Lebanese airspace is not really closed down. We were able to see video footage of uh, Israeli airstrikes being conducted inside of Beirut here in this clip. Well, you can see some shooting stars, but these are not the stars that you make a wish on. These are the stars that remove your wishes, because it seems as though that once again the Israelis are making sure to target and wipe out more Hezbollah forces within Beirut and to also try and once again decapitate more military abilities of the Hezbollah forces. Once again, a very big ordeal, and we're going to be seeing that once again Hezbollah, along with losing their intelligence forces, along with losing their command forces, are now going to be losing even more important and uh, very technically uh, necessary abilities for them to be able to conduct a proper defense or an attack against the IDF forces currently within southern Lebanon. Meanwhile, one of our last pieces of news from the Middle East is that apparently there is no news from the Middle East, and this actually moves us on into Ukraine, as we were able to hear that inside of Moscow a pretty wild thing happened. A military command school caught on fire. Now this little clip right here is a very interesting one because it is showing us the school as it exists on fire. And some people will be wondering, why is that the case? Well, there's a couple of reasons why this may be the case. One, it may be Ukrainian sabotage, which is a somewhat likely option. A second option is that there is a shooting range and a gas station right next door to the school. Now, here in America, we just call that public school, but over there in Russia, this is a little bit unique because a shooting range right by a military school, right outside of the military school, and a gas station right there, it just sounds like a bad combination, like an errant round could end up hitting the gas station, maybe setting a fire, and then that fire spreads and starts burning down the school. We're not entirely sure, but it is very interesting to see how much Russia says they hate the West, yet their schools only reflect what American schools look like these days days. Very interesting to see. And once again, got to give it to them. Some pretty impressive stuff right there that once again, another uh, combined arms command school has ended up burning down. Meanwhile, we were also able to see that an absolute record has been broken today. That little red arrow right there is pointing at a T-72 main battle tank's turret. That turret is 250 feet above the ground. It is airborne. That thing is getting Delta flight miles. And what is most impressive about this thing is that it is the highest turret toss ever seen in the war. This is the record breaker right here on day 960, I think, of the war. It's somewhere around there. We haven't been able to keep track of that too much over the past few days. But at this point in the war, we finally got the highest turret toss, 250 feet. This thing flew higher than the Statue of Liberty. That's how high this thing flew. And the turret's not light. The turret's about 10 tons or so. It's an incredibly heavy piece of equipment. And that thing got sent into space. Pretty impressive to see, really cool to note, and we're going to be trying to keep track of the turret toss records to make sure that this isn't beaten anytime soon because we're thinking at this point, there's really no way to beat this. 250 feet is about as high as the turret can get. 
And if it gets any higher than that, we will be wildly amazed, even if it's just by several feet. However, we were also able to hear that inside of Russia, the manpower situation is continuing to get worse. As the Russian uh, media has started to show that Moscow is cracking down on the younger people within the country, and they're beginning to check their papers. Now, that doesn't really seem that shocking, considering that Russia is an authoritarian state. But the reason behind checking these papers is to make sure that these people are of a young enough age and conscription age where they could be mobilized later. We are starting to hear that things are getting really bad in the Russian Federation with the manpower situation. And while they've been largely telling people to join the army, it still is not enough. And they're now trying to make sure that there are enough conscriptable people throughout the country so that way they can once again begin a new wave of mobilization and get these people out there on the front lines and right into the meat grinder to be turned into more delicious sausage. Meanwhile, in our last little bit of news that we were able to see, we were also able to see that the Russians are continuing to steal grain from inside of Ukraine. Grain is a very important resource, crazily enough, and while the food supply chain seems to be incredibly secure and at some points wildly wasteful, with most global reports saying that around 40% of all food produced is pretty much wasted because no one consumes it and no one purchases it, the grains are a very important thing around the world. A lot of countries are actually largely in a deficit of grain, and the Ukrainian grain was usually the grain that would make up that disparity, shipping it to places like the Middle East, East Africa, and Southeast Asia. Ukrainian grain was wildly important, and Ukrainian grain for the Russians is a source of money. The Russians don't need more grain. The Russians, much like Ukraine, are largely a veritable breadbasket, being able to produce any amount of grains and any amount of crops they require to keep their population alive. However, this grain is very important as the Russians can now usurp the Ukrainians and their ability to sell the grain and sell this across the seas worldwide to countries that really can't refuse the purchase of the grain because they have to buy it at the cheapest price and they need it so that way they don't starve. And because of that, the Russians are able to make money off of this and continue to fund and finance their war inside of Ukraine. Although it's not a lot of money, it still is a way that the Russians are trying to make illicit amounts of money to be able to keep the war going. But nevertheless, that is all of the breaking news that we have today. I've got to thank each and every one of y'all so much once again for watching. I hope the audio quality hasn't been too bad if you made it to this point in the video. I thank you. Right now we're still recording largely in a wind tunnel in the middle of Nebraska, so it's a little bit hard to try and make sure that we can actually keep the audio pretty good. So I do apologize that the audio quality wasn't great, but I hope that the news was actually really good. And if y'all did enjoy, Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and support us on Patreon. I get to give a huge thanks to everyone who's been supporting this channel so far on Patreon, through the Super Chats, on the live streams, because y'all are the only people who have made this channel possible for about three years at this point, and we promise y'all that we will be getting back on air with live streams as soon as we possibly can. We are still working on that at the moment, and that should be coming around probably within the next few days, maybe the next two to three days, possibly but it's going to be very soon. We are working tirelessly on it and it will happen. And so a big thanks to you all once again, and I will see you all in the next one.